The following set of video clips is a tour through several examples of surface nuclear magnetic resonance applications for field studies. The objective is to show a variety of settings and measurement strategies related to successful acquisitions. For our first example, we'll go to a region of central Australia where nearly all human and agricultural water needs are met by groundwater. While groundwater is relatively abundant, there's an added complication of water quality. Some of the aquifers are too high in salts to be used for livestock. Our objective was to use surface NMR along with measurements of electrical properties to identify areas likely to have usable water. Here we're fortunate to have access on dirt tracks to each measurement location, so the instrument is operated out of the back of a truck. The power for the surface NMR instrument is sourced from 12 volt deep cycle batteries, so a substantial portion of the data acquisition cycle time is waiting for the capacitors to charge. The surface sediments in this area had a substantial amount of iron-rich particles. While this is not necessarily representative of the whole formation below ground, it does suggest that we need to be careful to interpret the relaxation time data in the context of magnetic material. We also use time domain electromagnetic measurements in part to retrieve a ground resistivity structure that can be used in the surface NMR inversion. Here's an example of the type of results we got from this study with the gray curves indicated the NMR drive water content and areas that are high water content on top of the blue high resistivity formation suggest good water quality. For more information on these results, check out this paper in The Leading Edge. Next we'll go to central Alaska, where we're working on a small lake that is surrounded by permafrost. This lake is thawing into carbon-rich sediments, and the carbon is converted to methane through microbial decomposition. Our objective here is to measure the depth of thaw below the lake. Surface NMR is well suited for this because there's a difference in liquid water content between the thawed and frozen material, and the ability to directly detect liquid water means that we don't have to worry about other physical properties of the below ground formations when we interpret the data. To lay out the circular loops, we start by swinging an arc using a measuring tape and marking the loop shape in the snow. Then we just unroll the cables along the marked tracks. Here you can see the main parts of the surface NMR instrument. On the left is the DC-DC converter that steps up the battery voltage. In the middle is the data acquisition unit that controls transmission and receiving. And the right is a tuning unit that sets the properties of the loop to enable optimum transmitted power. All of this is controlled through a laptop. Here's a look at the tuning unit. By manually selecting the capacitors, we can control the electrical properties of the loop.
Since the instrument uses high voltage power, we're careful not to disconnect the wires when it's charged. And we have an emergency off button in case there's any problem. As I mentioned earlier, gases are produced in the thawed sediments. These gases ascend through the water column and become tra trapped in the lake ice in the winter. Here's what it looks like when there are trapped gases in the ice. By probing into these gas pockets, we can release the gas and ignite it as a rough field validation that it is methane and not other gases like CO2. The NMR instrument uses between 300 meters to 1200 meters of cable to make the measurement, so proper cable management during cleanup is essential to avoid tangles. To end up with neatly coiled cables, there's no quick way to do it. It's best to roll up a cable a bit at a time and go slowly. For our next example, we'll travel farther north to the Arctic coastal plain of Alaska, a permafrost region with many large sh shallow lakes. Since each measurement can take an hour or more, we sometimes set up a tent to keep the instrument warm and shielded from blowing snow. On warm spring days, we also run the instrument out in the open. Here you can see some of the cable connections. While we're only using a single loop for transmitting and receiving in this case, you can see the other inputs for extra loops that could be used for 2D imaging or noise compensation coils. Although it's hard to tell in this flat topography, we are working on a lake here using a large 90 meter diameter loop. If we use a loop that doesn't require the entire 150 meter spool of wire to enclose the perimeter, we deploy the remainder as a zero area loop, or just a back and forth line of wire that won't contribute to the area of the loop. The types of results we get from these measurements on lakes can be seen here, with the areas of subsurface with thawed permafrost indicated as elevated water content. To get the background magnetic field strength at each site needed for calculation of the Larimore frequency, 
We use a proton precession magnetometer as seen here. For more information on these results in NMR and permafrost environments can be found here in this paper published in the journal Geophysics.